Pedro from AMP Reacts. I'm here today with Brittany Slays from Unleash the Archers to talk about their upcoming new album, Abyss. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How about you? I'm I'm doing wonderfully. And it's really nice to have a chance to sit down and, and chat with you again. I thought maybe perhaps after our last chat, it kind of went sideways a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I, I thought you'd be like, okay, I'm going to put this guy on, on my not talk to list. <laughs> no, never, never. Uh, I don't decide anyways anymore. Napalm is the one that does all that. <laughs> so, so, so basically, I have to thank them for you putting me on the there. list. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Um, difficult times that we're going through the last the last tour, even before we talk about the album, I, I want to check with you on this, because you guys were in the middle of a tour. You were actually supposed to play Toronto. I was actually going to be at that show, and I had an interview scheduled with you at that show. And then COVID happened and the whole tour fell apart and, and there was no more shows. And, and you guys just had to, I'm assuming, hop on, on a plane or get back on the bus and, and drive all the way to Vancouver, which is, which is quite the, the long journey. Uh, how do you feel about everything that has happened since and, and what kind of impact has had on Unleash the Archers? Well, it was very upsetting, that's for sure. Um, we, uh, yeah, we were in the middle of a tour. We woke up in Minneapolis and were told that the, that the show wasn't happening. And uh, we were like, okay, well, let's see if we can salvage the, the other dates. You know, none of the promoters had said anything to us about potentially canceling. So we started contacting them all and they were all like, oh yeah, no, I don't know if this is going to happen. And so we basically went for brunch with Dragon Force. And at the beginning of brunch, we were all like, okay, well, let's see what we can salvage and who's what's happening here. And by the end of it, it was like, okay, we were all on flights home. There was nothing, nothing happening. By the end of it, the Toronto show was canceled. Um, everything, everything was canceled. So we were just like, holy crap, like this is, this is real. And uh, so we booked flights uh, from Chicago because I can't remember what it was. It was just the, the way that it was going to work out with having to drop the bus off and everything, it was better to fly out of Chicago. So we booked it to Chicago, literally just threw all of our merch at the FedEx guy and was like, get it there, back to the printer or whatever, back to Napalm, and, um, and hopped on the plane. And 24 hours later, it was like madness in that airport. And 24 hours later, our borders were closed and Europe's borders were closed. And everything just was like crashing down around us and uh and then so we of course had to quarantine we had to self-isolate or whatever for 14 days when we got back and everything else fell apart while we were sitting on our couches wondering what the heck to do with ourselves uh, all of the festivals started to cancel and the tour that we had booked for the fall canceled and it was just horrible and i definitely um <laughs> filled my stocked my fridge up with beer and, and kind of self-medicated for a little while there very Canadian but, uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um but yeah so it's it's definitely been interesting and I mean the release has been great so far people are really liking it but it, 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 who knows what's going to happen right with um when the album finally comes out I mean like people are, are people even going to have the money to buy the cd and all that sort of thing and it's really very, it's very good. Interesting. That was the next thing I wanted to ask you is, did you guys even think about pushing the date maybe into 2021 or, or later this year? I know next year is going to be a clusterfuck because everybody's pushing their albums to 2021. Hmm. But but did that thought cross your mind or you guys were set on, on having it on this date? Oh, yeah. No, it, it, it got pushed back a month. It was originally supposed to come out like mid-July. And then so they pushed it back five weeks. And... Um, and then they were like, okay, well, we'll wait and see what happens. And the pressing plants and everything started opening up again and all the CD manufacturers and stuff. So they were like, okay, well, I think we can stick with this. And I was like, you know what, let's do that. Because so many people were pushing to the fall and yeah, and 2021. And I was kind of like, I know I personally am thirsty for new music right now. Like every Friday I'm on my Spotify looking at what's new, checking out my release radar. And uh, so I think I was kind of like, I think now might be a good time to release. And sure, we're not going to recoup all those costs, you know, being able to tour. I was like, but we'll do it, you know, if you guys give us a break, we can do it in 2021. And um, hopefully. <laughs> and so Napalm was like, okay, yep, sure. And so we, you know, we slotted in there for the release time and just decided to stick with it and, and see what happens. 
it, it's it's really crazy times. And I remember that Toronto show. You mentioned the Toronto show. That was not originally part of that North American tour. You guys added that show kind of yeah. like the tour had already been announced. And then you guys added that show. I was so excited. Finally, I was going to see you guys in Toronto. And then all of this happened. But obviously, there's bigger problems in the world. But I, I really feel like I, I'm with you. I really feel like releasing the album now is a good thing because everybody's at, at home or quarantining or, well, at least not going to shows. So you, you need you need some music. You need something to kind of take your mind away from all the negativity that uh, that's on TV every time you turn on the TV. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> basically. Yeah, did, no. did, did the success of Apex condition you guys or put pressure on you guys going into this to this album? Absolutely. <laughs> we um we 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 knew we wanted to try some new things and experiment with stuff, and that's why we were like, okay, we're gonna put synth on this record, and um, yeah, we're gonna, quite a bit. We're, yeah, we're <laughs> totally influenced by new artists and bands and albums, and um, but then there was also a, a large part that was saying like, yeah, but people loved Apex so much, like so many people discovered us because of that album, so we can't like go on a completely different direction or we might lose everyone that just found us so it was a fine line for sure and I mean it was really funny because I was like oh I don't care I you know I like this part I'm gonna do it like this and and then the, in the back of my mind I was like oh but are people gonna like it like oh you know we have so many more fans now than we had when we wrote Apex so so that is like 2,000 times the expectation as well right so it's awesome and we love it and we are so excited but it's also kind of like now we have this you know bigger group to not not so much impress but um to keep in mind whenever we write so yeah it's i mean obviously it's going to be there we want to make sure that everyone enjoys the record and but we also want to be able to fill, fulfill ourselves musically and creatively so I think from listening to the album, I think you guys kind of walk that fine line and, and it's not necessarily an easy line to walk between trying to go with something new, but still connecting with the past. And this album has that connection from a concept perspective as well. Did you guys feel that the story was not finished, that there was more to be told? And that's why you guys continue with the concept? Uh, both both albums were written back in 20, I mean, not albums, but the story was written back in 2016. So originally it was going to be, we were thinking it'd be like a two disc release, so Apex and Abyss as like a two disc sort well, of almost thingy. like use your illusion to go back in the day. Like Sorry? Use, like use your illusion one and two, but, but with a concept. Right, right. And, um, but then we were kind of like, okay, hey, well, we had, a, had a, a deadline from Napalm and, and we were taking our sweet time with Apex. So we were kind of like, okay, well, we need to be able to focus on each album. So we decided to separate them. And, but the story for both was written already, part one and two, basically, yeah. And, uh, and it changed, of course, a little bit over time as I got riffs from the boys and stuff. Apex changed a little bit and then Abyss changed a little bit. But it was always meant to be this way, the way that it, that the story turned out. So um, that is kind of, you know, it, we wanted it to be similar to Apex, but we also, because it's a different, it's like a, it's on a completely different plane. Apex is very grounded, and Abyss is very ethereal, sort of celestial. So we knew we wanted them to sound different, but to kind of have that same, um, just that same underlying tone, really. Um, but Apex is it's definitely like a darker record, I'd say. It's really funny because the words kind of are the opposite. <laughs> Apex, you think like, yeah. Like uh, something yeah. positive. And Abyss, you think like deep Darkness. in the depths. Yeah. And it's like the exact opposite. Um, but because I think of Apex as the mountain and Abyss as the abyss of space, which is like the ultimate freedom. Like, you know what I mean? There's nothing stopping you. You can go anywhere, basically. Whereas Apex is like, you got a planet and that's it. That's You're, you're kind of stuck to that. Limited. So that's, yeah, that's where it came from for me. Where were I? What were we talking about? I got lost. If the, if the story, if the story was, it was more to be told, and you and you were saying that the story was already together. It, yes, it's just yeah. you didn't want to release the two albums, and you decided to break them apart and do it this way. 
which then begs the begs the question that you already touched a little bit on it in terms of the synths and how much was used on this record. Do you feel like, and I like it because it plays well with the storytelling, with the concept, with with almost the sci-fi feel that the record has. But do you feel like if this album was released back with Apex as one and two, would, would that sound be the same? Or is this something that just kind of grew into it? It totally was different, yeah. And <clears throat> if we had written Abyss when we wrote Apex, it would have been a completely different record. It, like, on all sides. And uh, so after the success of Apex, you know, we grew and we changed as musicians and our influences changed and the bands that we were listening to at, this, at the time changed. And so we took a whole six months off at the beginning of 2019 just to like emotionally and mentally separate ourselves from Apex, from playing those songs live, from doing all of that so that we could come at Abyss with a completely fresh slate, basically. Clean slate? Anyways. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess you can, you can say that. A fresh perspective, and uh, and we wanted it to be different, and we knew that we that we were gonna, you know, we can't help but write the way that we do. So obviously, it's gonna be there's gonna be touches of Apex and that UTA style, and you know, my voice isn't gonna change or anything. So there's always gonna be that aspect that will remain the same. But we definitely wanted it to be different, and we wanted it to be that next step, kind of. And uh, we were really worried because so many people. We're like, ooh, new album from Unleash the Archers. But pretty sure Apex was their Apex. So like, what, you know, what are they going to do here? So that's why we were just like, you know what? We're not going to try and write the next Apex. We're going to do something completely different here and hope that uh, that people get it, basically. I, I, I personally really enjoyed the album. And I really like the synthesizer touch that you guys had. Like I said, that's a cinematic sci-fi feel. When I was listening to the record, I felt like I was listening to the soundtrack of like Space 1999 from back in the day or, or, or uh, you know, something along those lines, like V, you know, all, all of these old mm. sci-fi movie, uh, movies or TV series from the late 80s, early 90s. Like, nice. uh, it just kind of had that, that throwback feel that you guys have in your sound. And then you add those synthesizers. So it really sounds like a soundtrack to a movie. It kind of plays itself that way. So I, I, feel, I feel like you guys did a wonderful job connecting the sound with the storytelling, the concept, the tracks, and, and making a new sound and a new a new feel for for this record. Thank you. I'm glad, because you, know, you never really know, right? You just kind of are going along doing what you do, and you hope for the best. You just hope that people enjoy it and understand what you know what you were going for, really. So that's great. The the structure of the album, as we get into the record, this was the first thing that that kind of came at me was the the opening and closing of the album. I felt like you guys created two bookends. All right. So if you imagine the uh, different books in a shelf and you have these two bookends that holds all the books together, that is the beginning. That is the end of your record. You start yep. off with Waking Dream that then bleeds in into Abyss. Before we go into Afterlife, which is the closing track, those two songs to me felt almost like one. I like the idea that you guys break them into two tracks because Waking Dream works as an intro and also works as part of the of Abyss. So it kind of has like three roles. It's a song of its own, it's the intro, and it's part of Abyss. It's, it's a really strange opening, but it works so well. <laughs> it's, it's just, I had, I had a really hard time wrapping my head uh, around that, that opening of the album. I thought it was so cool. I went actually back a few times just to listen to it because I thought it was, you guys really created a perfect introduction to the album. How did that idea of breaking Waking uh, Dream from Abyss, because you could totally have them as just one single track. Well, we originally were just going to start with Abyss. That was going to be the opener. And the tapping part that is at the end of Waking Dream was going to be like how we came into the record. But after the... That was like back in 2016 when we were originally writing both records together. But then with the way that Apex turned out, which was one of the last tracks that we wrote for Apex, it was kind of like it wasn't right. So we knew that we needed to put something in the middle as as like an interlude and initially we were going to kind of just do an intro slash type interlude kind of thingy where we were going to take like a little bit of apex like some riffage maybe even or just the chord progressions and then have them somehow work into abyss but then uh, <clears throat> we just kind of got this idea of it being like a, a, a like a, a song but not quite a song 
<laughs> and yeah, it's really, it's really weird. And so then what we ended up doing is instead taking a riff from Afterlife and putting it as the intro and making it feel like Apex, but not actually being a part of Apex. So well, the point is that you can listen to Apex into uh, Abyss and have it kind of feel the same, but change very much so, so that you can feel like something's happening, something's going on. We're not on this planet anymore. We're not in the Immortals Mountain anymore. And, um, and then I don't know if you noticed, but the chorus of Afterlife is the whole melody of Waking Dream. And I had written the chorus for Afterlife first, or no, it was really weird. I wrote them like at the same time because I knew that that riff was going to be the, um, the intro. And so I kind of, I wrote the melody to Waking Dream and then I made sure that it worked and changed it a little bit so that it would work as the chorus for Afterlife as well. And then kind of like wrote them in tangent so that they would do exactly that bookend the record. And also you could get that feeling of the immortal is in this kind of weird dream state, but it's a little bit darker. Whereas in then Afterlife, it's that same feeling, but it's like he's now stepped out into the light, basically. Yeah, it, it has a, a, <laughs> Afterlife gave me this sense of conclusion yeah. It, it almost like the, the whole album, uh, the track listing that you guys decided to go with is magnificent because it, it really gives you a sense of a cinematic feel. Like there's ups and downs, there's peaks and valleys, there's climatic moments and then uh, more like down to earth, more like what you would call it, melancholic moments within the record. There's all these different things that happen the same way in a movie. And I felt like Afterlife is almost a perfect conclusion. It, it answers some questions, but it also leaves... Some, uh, some questions open in terms of what the future record would even be. So it has this weird sensation of closing down the album, the curtains are coming down, the credits are rolling up, but at the same time, there's a little bit of a cliffhanger in the way you guys created that track. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's meant to be like the triumphant end. Yeah, exactly. Basically, yeah, the, core, the credits should be rolling in that last little part there. That was kind of the point. That was Andy's idea to do that whole thing. So, you know, Freaking awesome, Andy. We loved it the second <laughs> the second we heard it. Yeah, exactly. And um, but yeah, I I also wanted to kind of really showcase the trepidation of the moment. It's like I don't want to give it away or anything, but it's kind of like awesome. Now what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it kind of leaves you like like when you watch the last episode of a series that you really like. Yeah, and it's like okay, it it answered all these questions that we had, but now like what's what's like what's next? It kind of leaves you hanging, like wanting yeah. more. It's, and it, um, that was the that was the goal. You guys hit it. Well, I mean, like uh, there is a lot of potential for the immortal still in the future to be a part of something, um, and so I didn't want to end it like, and they all lived happily ever after, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. Like it could go on. Or it could, I could do like a prequel or I could do something completely different or who knows, you know, I didn't want it to be the end. And because I, I know personally, like that's the worst when I've just read like 12 books in a series and then it's like, oh, that's it, that, oh no, like these, these characters are my friends <laughs> and then uh, that horrible feeling of it being over. And so I kind of wanted to like avoid that a little bit, but yeah, <laughs> I, th I think you guys achieved that goal of, of finishing it but but not quite like dot 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 yeah it, yeah. it, it kind of has it kind of has that feel uh I, I felt like your vocals were magnificent on this album did you take the approach of being the centerpiece i mean it's almost like uh silly what i'm asking because every album of unleash the archers you are the centerpiece but did you feel like perhaps with this record with the story that's being told you're more of a centerpiece I don't really know. Um, I really feel like kind of the riffage is is super important, but I got to I got I, I get the kind of the worst and the best part because I get to put that last layer on top of everything and I get to hear everything once it's already together and then sort of add to it. So there's it's really easy for me to make sure that I don't clash with things. Um, but there were quite a few songs that I wrote like in Denmark because I just really needed to get that that feeling right. And um, so, of course, ev the boys, everyone records before I do. 
and um, and I'm the last one to go in there, and I take basically the entire last week just for me. And um, <laughs> so Jacob was sending me everything as he was doing it. So he was like, just quick little mix down and send it to me, and then I would write to it. And uh, and it was which was normally pretty easy because I have the story already. I know exactly what I need to say. It's just a matter of putting it out there eloquently and in a way that people can understand. So, um, but there were a couple parts where Andrew was just like, I, I don't know. I really like that riff. I don't think you should sing here. <laughs> like, or like, you know, something like that. And uh, he'd be like, I don't know. I, I really love this song. Like, but you gotta, you gotta really hit it out of the park on this one. Okay. And so like, and I was like, yeah, don't worry. Like chill out. Like I'm going to do my best. And then when we listened to it all at the end, Andrew just looked at me and was just like, I don't know why I, I even doubted you. He was just like, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, I, I constantly was thinking of that. Like, how do I make it so that I compliment everything? I don't want to just be wailing over top of all these beautiful riffs that Andy spent three months basically living in a dark hole to create. You know, it's an ex extremely important part of everything. It's not about me. It's about the band. And it's always been that way. And our music has always been that way. And I just, yeah, I just constantly am striving to, to do my best to be a part of the sound, not to be the sound. When you look at the, at the record or, and you look at the previous records, do you feel that you take a different approach with every album? Not, I'm not saying you sound differently on the albums, but considering that each album has a heartbeat of its own, has a story of its own, uh, it, it really has its own fingerprint. Do you, do you try to take a different approach, uh, maybe in the tone and the emotion that you have when you're going in, into the recording of the record? Absolutely. I mean, this this album is telling a very different story. In the first one, the immortal is kind of resigned to his fate and he's just doing what he's told. And it's kind of like this exciting new, all right, I'm awake and I got things to do and cool, but ah, you know, like <laughs> this kind of sucks. Whereas <laughs> Ab Abyss is, is very different. And it's so the emotional undertones of this record are very different. And so I wrote it very differently. He's in a whole different headspace right from the beginning. So it was important that you kind of feel that, yeah, that trepidation, you know, that kind of like, um, I'm alone. I don't know what's going on. I, yeah. I've been awakened by somebody, but I, you know, like, just kind of thinking back on his past. And then he's introduced to this new character who is like, he's like really kind of like, hmm, are you going to hate me? <laughs> and then they just, they like are like totally best friends, you know, and it's just, put, it's a whole different tone for sure. So I, I did my best to, to make sure that I bring that across as, as best as I can. I have to ask you about some of the tracks on this album. It's really hard to pick favorite tracks. The closing, the 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 beginning of the album, everything in between. It's really well placed. Like I said, the track listing on the record is outstanding. You really got you guys really created a great album that has great fluidity, engages the listener at the beginning, and keeps the listener engaged. But if I have to ask you about one song, the one that immediately when I went through the album the first time, that this is like this is going to be on my playlist forever. And that was faster than light. Oh my God, what a track. What a, like, I mean, I was like, I don't, I love the record. I love every song, but this one is staying here forever. It's not going anywhere. Uh, how did that track come together? Oh, it started with the opening riff, of course. And uh, uh, when we started writing Abyss, Andy and I were both like, we've never done like a legit power metal song. Like, sure, Tonight We Ride, but it has its own little death aspects and that kind of thing. Like, we need to do like a straight up Stradivarius Angra, like <clears throat> insert, you know, Rhapsody kind of, we need a straight up traditional power metal song. So Andy was like, well, I, I kind of have this idea. It's like a bit of a neoclassical riff, like Luca Turilli style. And I was like, well, let's hear it. And, um, <laughs> and of course it was amazing. And um, yeah. And so I was just like, yes, that's the one. I was like, let's go, let's do it. Let's figure it out. And uh, so just kind of arranged it from there with, with that opening riff in mind. And um, of course, we couldn't do it all power metal. We had to throw a breakdown in there, but um, it just- But it works, it just, it works really well. Yeah, right? It just felt right at the time. <laughs> we were kind of like, what do we do here? And I was like, breakdown? <laughs> um, 
but yeah i mean that i love that song it's i think it's awesome and i i'm really proud of that one because that is really the first time that we've ever been like let's write a power metal song. And I think we did, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, and, and, and I felt in the track listing leading up to that song, you guys had songs that, that had power metal influences in them. I, I wouldn't call them necessarily power metal tracks, at right. least not like this one, but but it was there was power metal moments within them. And, and then you hit us with this one and it was like, holy crap. And, and it's it really is faster than light. I mean, the whole song <laughs> is absolutely like, it's like a snowball effect with this track. It just keeps getting bigger and faster and bigger and faster. It's just just incredible song. Thank you. I'm really glad. Yeah, we we took very, I mean, we were very careful with every track. And the way, you know, you, you said that the way that they fit together and like that was all so calculated. And we always made sure that every track felt right going into the next one. And it was kind of like Andy would be like, I'm thinking of this riff for this song. And I'd be like, well, OK, what's the song that comes before and what do we have for that right now? And it was just like, yeah, OK, that works. Or, you know, like, oh, you know what? That's not going to work. Like, we need to come up with something else. Or, you know what? That would actually be better for this track. And and we really it was just like a like a science almost of like trying to make sure that every song had its own thing going on, but also fit properly in the whole scheme of things. So. It was very, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty intense writing. <laughs> so when you guys were putting it together, it's not like you had all the songs and then decided what the final track listing were. You guys were kind of working on both things in parallel with each other. This oh, yeah. is the song you're working on. This is where this song is going to go and therefore. Yeah. The only thing that we really had before we sat down and we're like, okay, now we're going to focus on Abyss was um, Ab um, Abyss, the, the, the tapping part before abyss and there was a couple riffs here and there that we had taken out of um apex and said you know no nah, no nah, that's not right for this album kind of a thing and put them in the old bag of riffs and uh but abyss was really where it all started and so i was like okay so if this is how the album starts and then we're gonna have like an interlude thingy i was like so what comes after that like what, what are we feeling you know what do we need and it's like okay well if he's alone in space like there's totally got to be and this is like chapter two or whatever He's alone on a spaceship and he feeling bad for himself. Basically, it's like what it was. And so it was like, and we really wanted to do a synth wave kind of feel. Um, what does Andy call it? A Van Hagar kind of track. <laughs> and so he's like, I think that this might be the spot where we do that, you know? And it was it was all like that constantly throughout. Um, the, the story, the guideline, the little track by track thingy that I wrote was constantly being referenced. And it was really just like the bones of the whole of the whole process. I, I know what I'm going to say sounds super cliche. Every, everybody sa says this, but this album really feels like your most mature, most complex, uh, most dynamic album to date, at least in my opinion, after listening to the whole record and having an understanding of, of how everything has come together. Uh, where do you rank this album uh, when you look at the discography of the band? Oh, well, it's kind of biased because it's the new stuff and it's, it's the stuff we're most, the most excited. The, we're most, uh, the stuff we are the most excited about. So obviously I, this is like my favorite thing we've ever done. And it's my favorite record for sure. And I agree. It's, it's, we've really kind of figured out who we are as musicians and songwriters and what we like to do. And uh, I just, yeah, I think this is going to blow everything else out of the water. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully I, I it just, feels the same way. I don't. Yeah, I, I, just, I, don't. I just felt that listening to the record, you could feel the the experience that the band has gained, uh, mm -hmm. not just from recording the previous albums, but from touring, playing shows, understanding what works, and then how can we translate these songs into a live setting? Because eventually, you're going to have to play some of these songs live. So there's all of these factors at play. And when I listened to this record, it, it just sounded to me that you guys took, uh, you know, attention to every single detail of the record. And all of these things that went into your mindset and into the way that you guys created the album. That's why I said it feels like the most mature album. You guys didn't go in just as a bunch of teenagers with some beers in hand and just want to have fun and create a record, you know? I'm sure you've done that before. So <laughs> Definitely didn't do that. Um, but yeah, no, we, um, we carefully laid out every moment, basically, and every riff and every emotion and every tone and all the choices were made. Um, very much with uh, a direction in mind. So um, 
yeah, I would say that this is probably the the best we've ever written together. Uh, and we all, you know, we all knew that we were coming into it from a different mindset and that we were all in different, a different, way different place than we were at when we wrote Apex. And <clears throat> we're just, yeah, we're older now and we kind of maybe are fixed still. I mean, there's always still more to learn. There's always still things that we can do better. And I'll always have a thing or two on every record that I'm like, ah, God, I really should have, should have done it like this. But, um, you know, as of where we are at right now, this is a great reflection of, of how we've grown as musicians. And now you have the date, August 21st, the album comes out so everybody can listen to it. Everybody can be a critique and, and, <laughs> and, and tell you if they like it or not. But I'm sure everybody's going to really, I, I really don't see this album being polarizing. I, I honestly don't. Um, perhaps the synthesizers. That's good. <laughs> No, I, I feel that way because I, I really feel the, the album speaks for itself. The, the synthesizers in the beginning took me a little bit of time to get kind of like my head around it. But the more I got into the story and the more I listened to the record, the more it made sense in, in terms of, of how it plays with everything else. So I don't see this album being polarizing. But the date is around the corner, August 21st. The album comes out. Uh, is, is there? I know you're nervous. I know there's expectations. But if I could ask you right now... Uh, You know what? What is what? What are your personal goals when this album comes out to the, to the audience and everybody has a chance to, to listen to it? What, what is the ultimate goal for you that you want this album to reach? I don't think I have one. I think it's basically just I hope that people like it. <laughs> I hope that the people that are really really big fans of Apex, I hope they love this one just as much or maybe even more. There's a lot of people out there like on YouTube comments and things like that that are kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, it's good, but it's no Apex. And I just really hope they keep an open mind about this album. You read Because YouTube it's... comments? Oh, no, no. Scott That's a will... horrible thing to do. I, I have a YouTube channel and I don't read the YouTube comments. No, I know. But Scott, Scott tells me some of the good ones. And sometimes he'll be like, oh, look at this one. And then we'll scroll for a second or two or whatever through them, right? Um, but no, I definitely do not actively read the YouTube comments. Um, but you know, I've just, I've seen a few that are like that. They, and and not even, not even just YouTube, Instagram as well. Um, and, and Facebook and that kind of thing where it's just kind of like, it's no apex. And I just really hope that they don't let that blind them basically, because it is a different record and it's coming from a very different place, but I feel like it, It's, I feel like it's a better record, just personally, with the way that it moves together and the way that we wrote everything together and, and the different um, genres and ideas that we have on the record. And, you know, Apex to me is kind of like more of a rock infused album, whereas this one is like a sort of a prog metal y. God, I don't even know how to explain it. I was trying to, I was trying there's to come a lot up of different, with it. There's a, a lot of different pieces there. I felt like classic, like, pure classic heavy metal, you know, new wave, a little bit of new wave in there, prog, power metal. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many different uh, pieces of the puzzle, if you will, that creates the overall sound on the record. Yeah. And I don't know if people, yeah, that's the thing is I feel like it's personally, I think it's going to be polarizing because there's going to be people that are like, Ugh, I don't like synth on a record. And they're just going to like literally throw it aside because of one thing and or not even give it a shot or, you know, that kind of thing. And um, I feel like there are people that are going to do that. They're not even going to listen to it. They're just going to be like, I'm not giving it a chance because it has synth on it. And, it, and that's, you know, really unfortunate. And I, and I hope that doesn't happen because it's really not about the synth. The synth is on there, but it's just another little layer. And it's not the, the main thing. It's not the focus at all. It is basically just kind of a little cherry on top of everything else. That's it. So... Yeah, you know, I, I really don't know. I just, I just hope that people like it. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you think it's going to be polarizing. I, I, I hope it's not. And I, for me, it wasn't uh, because I, I, I listened to the album for what it is. I, I'm not a big fan of comparing records at all. I think you have to look at each album on the credits or the merits of, of the record on its own. Does it stand on its own? I, I don't like comparing. If I want to listen to Apex, I'll go listen to Apex. You right. Know, I, I, yes. I don't want you guys to do Apex version 2.0. That's that's yeah. going to be down the road when you guys are celebrating uh, the 25th anniversary of the record and you do a re-release. Yeah. 
You, yeah, you know that's I mean? one of the that's one of the things that like people are like, oh, can you just write another Tonight We Ride? And it's like, no. If you want to hear Tonight We Ride, go listen to Tonight We Ride. And yeah. it's like if I if I want to hear Painkiller, I'm gonna go listen to Painkiller. You know, I'm not gonna wait for Judas Priest to put out another Painkiller. That is ridiculous. That album is already made. It's written. It's there. So go listen to that one. And just try and be open-minded and understand that musicians can't write the same record over and over again or they'll freaking shoot themselves. They'll just die. Except if you're a Nickelback. <laughs> exactly. See, we go full circle. We go full circle. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have a chat without, without bringing the great Canadian export Nickelback uh, in, into the mix. Uh, I, I think fans of metal now are more evolved than what they were 10, 15, even 20 years ago. Uh, I, I think... Fans now expect bands to have more of that growth and that change in their sound uh, more than they did maybe 10, 15 years ago, where you wanted your band to have the same sound from the first record all the way to the last record. It's, right. It starts to get boring. Mm -hmm. it, you know what I mean? It's, it's almost like you're just rehashing the same crap and, and resell it to me with a different box. Yeah. Uh, I find it boring uh, yeah, you know, I agree. When, when I see that. And I, and, and there are some bands that, that are doing that, and I do not even bother listening to the new thing because the last one that I listened to before and the one before that were exactly the same. So why should I invest in listening to the next one, you know, when you, like, guys, try something new. <laughs> yeah, do an industrial album. But I'm not saying for <laughs> you guys to do an industrial album. It would be interesting. It would be interesting, but, you know, never know. Maybe down the road one day when you guys are, like, I like industrial music. You never know. Me too. Me too. I just, I just imagine Unleash the Archer releasing like a, a blend of power metal and industrial record. That would be something else. Talk about being polarizing. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> maybe have, one day. <laughs> maybe one day. You never know. I mean, you guys eventually will get to a point where, where you guys are going to be so famous, so big. Uh, yeah. you, you guys are going to be the Metallica of Canada. You know, not okay. the Nickelback, the Metallica. And then you guys can do whatever you want. You know, you could re you could release a joint album with Nickelback, and it would be absolutely fine. That would be nice. I mean, not the joint album thing. The, the Metallica is famous as Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not not gonna get my hopes up. <laughs> I have one more question for you, and and that is considering everything that's happening right now with COVID and all the restrictions. Uh, you guys have the album coming out on August 21st. Are you guys planning on doing? Uh, something or what are you guys planning on doing? I should ask it that way in order to promote this record and, and stay visible to the fans once the album is actually released. Yeah, we're going to do like a, a streaming show thingy, probably like the weekend the album comes out. And um, I don't think we're going to do it live. It's just, we're just, I, there's just too much that could go wrong. <laughs> so um, we'll probably pre-record it and then um do like a whole like hangout and in a chat room and that kind of thing and and uh you can have you know buy tickets and have a certain block of time or whatever where you can watch it and then we just we're gonna try and hang out on twitch more um do like impromptu jam sessions with you guys or whatever that kind of thing or, or uh andy and i both stream on twitch though so if you ever just want to come hang out with us that's where we are um but yeah we're gonna we're gonna try and do our best we can't we can't tour, so we're going to try and hang out with you guys in whatever way that we can. And right now it's it's crazy busy, but we're not going to have anything to do in the fall. So hopefully it'll be it'll be us on Twitch with you guys as opposed sounds, to at sounds live like shows. Fun. Sounds <laughs> like fun. I, I'm going to finish this by telling you what I, what I say every time we check out one of your videos on, on our channel, which is, Brittany, you absolutely slay. <laughs> thank you on, on, you you absolutely I, I say this on the, i know it's a cliche now too but i say it on every video because you do you're absolutely consistent across the record magnificent album i really enjoy this record and and thank, thank you. you for creating an album that has such an interesting structure that beginning and that closing is just it's just <laughs> uh it, it blew me away i loved it i loved it thank you so much i'm i'm glad it's good to know because <laughs> you you never know, right? We never. we made the record and and we all we all just sat on it for like four months or whatever before anybody else heard it and and it was just it's nice to to finally get to hear everyone's opinion. So thank you. My my pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the time. Stay safe and stay healthy. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me.